Johnny Tremaine, A Story of Boston and Revolt by Esther Forbes. We're on chapter five, part one. This chapter is entitled The Boston Observer, part one. They went to the Afric Queen and ate in the dining room. This time, no one asked to see the color of Mr. Quincy's money. The party even grew a little noisy. Isana, Johnny, and Mr. Quincy himself were the most hilarious. Many of the leading Whigs dined daily at the Queen, and one man after another stopped at their, ta at their table to laugh over Merchant Light's public discomfort discomfiture that morning in court. Hadn't Quincy practically caught the old fox thieving a silver cup from an apprentice? Mr. Quincy, flushed and happy, agreed to all, all this. But more seriously, he warned Johnny to watch out for himself. Mr. Light was very proud. That pride had been hurt. From now on, he and Johnny, he was Johnny's enemy. But all enjoyed themselves, although Isana drank herself sick and silly on silly bubs. <laughs> Johnny was disappointed when Rab told exactly how he'd got Scylla to court that day. It was not half so exciting as a story of a story as Johnny had expected. Rab had simply shown Miss Lathan a letter signed by Governor Hutchinson and stamped with the great seal of the colony. It had been sent to Mr. Lorne commanding him and the other printers of Boston to quit their seditious rebellious publications or else. Mrs. Latham could not read. All Rab had done was to all Rab had done was to take Scylla by the arm, unfurl the letter at Mr. L at Mrs. Latham, point to the seal and say, Governor's orders. He had not given her time to call the well-educated Mr. Tweedy out of the shop. Rab and Scylla ran hell for leather to the courthouse. He had already schooled Isana and hidden her nearby in case he was unable to produce Scylla. Both girls, he thought, had done marvelously. That's what Miss Light said, the little girl agreed eagerly. At least she said, I was wonderful and, oh, forget it, said Johnny rudely. That Isana was just about getting above herself. During dinner, it seemed to Rab that Johnny planned to go back to the Lathams to sleep and to Scylla that he was moving and to Scylla that he was moving in with Rab. Ah, but Johnny decided to sponge on neither. Not until he had a, had a job and something a little, a lot better than delivering papers for Uncle Lorne. He had noticed the number of boys who came and went about the Queen's table. The wind was howling up from the sea, beating the waves against the wharves. It was a fine fall, the days crisp and full of sparkle, but the nights from now on would be too cold in the open, although warm enough hidden away in the stable with hay or a horse blanket to cover one and the warm animals giving off heat. He slept in the stable that night and on the next day, did find a sea captain who would, in spite of the bad hand, take him on as a cabin boy. Johnny did not like the captain, the ship, nor the voyage. It was going to Halifax. It was going to Halifax, and the cold turn, turn the weather had taken, and his insufficient clothing made him desire a trip to the tropic sugar isles above all else. But all seemed settled until the shipmaster casually told him he must furnish his own blankets oilskins, sea boots, warm pea jacket. Johnny had no money to buy such things. Having no safe place to live his cup, to leave his cup, he had tied the strings of the flannel bag to his belt. It strung, it struck at him as he walked. The luckiest thing he had ever done was to disobey his mother and show this cup to Scylla last July. Now he, he would disobey her again and sell it. There was many silversmiths who would have bought it, but the cup was so old-fashioned he could not expect from them more than its value in old silver. However, Mr. Light, owning the matching cups, would pay a very good price. So once more he went to that merchant's, he went to that merchant's counting house on Long Wharf. It was the same as before, except Cousin Seawall was not there. The grasshopper old clerks were bent over their ledgers. Neither moved as Johnny slipped quietly past them and entered the inner office. Mr. Light looked up from his papers. There was a glimmer almost of hatred 
in the sliding black eyes as he recognized Johnny. His justice had humiliated him suddenly, uh, not suddenly, publicly, and the story had gone quickly around the wharves among his friends. He spoke very quietly. Well, look, I have no money, no food, only the clothes I stand in. I've no choice. This cup is worth about four pounds if I sold it for old silver. I'm a silversmith and I know. But to you, because it matches your others, it's worth about four times as much. Give me 20 pounds and you can have it. Through the melted tallow on his face, there was a faint flush of blood. Although his voice was suave enough, Johnny knew he was furious. I've never yet bought stolen goods. I'm not going to begin now, not even with my own. Johnny put the cup back in its bag, but before he could tie the strings to his belt, Mr. Light's long fingers had reached out and taken it. If you give me my property, Johnny said politely, I'll take it to Mr. Revere or Mr. Burnt. Four pounds is all I really need. Now wait a minute, young man. You know you stole it. Make a clean breast of the matter and I will not be too hard on you. Justice Dana was a fool to be taken in by those lying girls. I didn't steal it. That was settled for all time in court. Once on his feet, Mr. Light moved quickly enough. He was at the door blocking Johnny's escape. Haddon and Barton, he said. The old clerks came scurrying in, their pens in their hands. Sea walls still down the wharf, seeing about molasses. Very well. We can do what's to be done better without that puppy. How Haddon and Barton, here a boy. Now Haddon and Barton, here's a boy. That Johnny Tremaine. You've heard tell. Yes, sir. Shut and lock that door. He's not so sunk in poverty and vice, but I have a glimmer of conscience. No, sir. And so two days after Mr. Dana found him innocent of stealing my cup, he comes to me privately, confesses the theft, and wishes to return to me. Oh my gosh, this man is a devil, if I've ever seen one. Indeed, very noble of him, sir. Mr. Haddon and Mr. Barton, you are witnesses of his repentance and voluntary return of my stolen property. Yes, sir. Give me 20 pounds, Johnny was breathing hard. You thick twitted little wharf rat. Go whistle for it. I have two respectable witnesses who will go into court and swear that whatever I say is true. Do you think any court in Boston, even Dana's, would listen to you, your wretched girls, and your wretched girls, if I and my clerks and countrywise? You daring to suggest you are my kin? Johnny saw he was trapped. I'll get that cup back, he said, through the white lips, you thief. Haddon, look, look in the street. See if Captain Bill is still about. Fetch him. If anyone is hung for stealing cups, it will not be me. Wharf rat, am I? You gallows bird. Threatening my life is he. Now I'm going to be too hard. Now I'm going to be too hard on you. <laughs> as long as you had the decency to admit your theft. Having a bad time getting work since you burned your hand, eh? Well, my Captain Bull is taking the unicorn to Guadalupe on ebb tide. Maybe you'd like to settle in Guadalupe. Boston is getting a little crowded. More opportunity in Guadalupe for lying, thieving, scurry knaves. Haddon came back with Captain Bull. Johnny gave the captain one startled glance. He was an enormously powerful man with a big with a neck as big as Johnny's waist and huge hands hanging down to his knees. Each hand looked as large as a bunch of bananas. The courtly bow, the courtly bow he attempted at his employer only made him, or bow that is, only made him seem more the baboon, but this formality gave Johnny one split second. He shot out of the inner office bef before Captain Bull had recovered from his bow. Haddon flung up his bony arm trying to stop him, but went down like a bunch of faggots. Johnny kept on running up Long Wharf and the short length of King Street. He dove down Crooked Lane into Dock Street, Dock Square, knocked over a basket of feathers a woman was selling, for a moment was mixed up in a drove of squealing pigs, but he knew where he was going and shot down Union Street. Salt Lane at last. 
and the little man observing Boston so genially through, the, through a spyglass. Then he stopped, looking behind him. The street was empty. No Captain Bull. Baboons could not run that fast. <laughs> Rab was not in the shop, only Uncle Lorne. Do you still want a horse, boy? He was breathing so hard he could hardly speak. Why, yes, said startled, said startled Mr. Lorne. Why, yes, said startled Mr. Lorne sometime. But there's no such a hurry. We've been hiring a boy from the Afric Queen for a month, and will I do? Mr. Lorne went to the window, opening up the shop's backyard. Rab was out there, brewing up a kettle of printer's ink. The web twins were learning how and fetching faggots for him. Rab, Rab, his uncle called to him. Here's that Johnny back again. Will he do for a rider? Yes, Rab's voice, cool, haunting, drifted back on a cloud of evil-smelling black smoke from the yard. Very well, Johnny, of course you know how to ride. I've never been on a horse in my life. Well, I'm afraid now, really. I can learn. I can learn. Rab, what? Can that Johnny Tremaine learn to ride a horse? Yes. All right, boy, you sit down and catch your breath, and I'll explain. This isn't a full-time job, and I can't do more than sleep you, bait you, and clothe you. But you'll have the first four days of the week to pick up money for yourself or to go with your learning, any if any. I've got a fine library. If Rab so, if Rab says so, you can sleep in the loft above the shop with him. If he'd rather go alone, my wife will put you across the way. The Observer is out every Thursday, and the papers are delivered to the Boston subscribers on that day. You can do it faster on horseback, but on foot if you'd rather. That takes most of the day. Then next day, Friday, you start about five in the morning, and you ride through Dor Dorchester. Roxborough, Brookline, Milton, and so on. Rab will draw you a map, leaving a certain number of papers at various ends. The subscribers go fetch them themselves. So late Friday or early Saturday, you cross the Charles and go through Cambridge, Waterton, Waltham, Lexington, and so on. And last is Charleston, Charlestown. From there, you cross back into Boston on the ferry Saturday night. Rab came in with a kettle full of warm black syrupy ink. There was not a smooched, there was not a smooch on his white shirt or leather apron. The webs were black as imps from hell. Oh. <laughs> Rab said his uncle, "Where's Johnny to sleep?" With me, of course. Well, you show him where. But first, take him over to Queen Stables and show him that horse you bought. If ever you made a bad bargain, it was when you got money for that goblin. But you take the afternoon off and give Johnny a lesson in equitation. Show him how to fall off without getting hurt. He'll need it if he's going to ride the devil, that devil. Johnny's new life had begun. The end of chapter five, part, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter five, The Boston Observer, part one.